once upon a time, in an enchanted kingdom, there lived a king and a queen and their son, a dashing prince. He was always dashing here and dashing everywhere. Blinded by love, the amorous prince could go to any length to find true happiness. I love you, darling. Will you marry me? Oh, yes, please. Well, almost any length. But the jealous, wicked witch did all in her power to destroy the prince's dream of true love. Consequently, his love affairs seemed to end in tears. He was turned into a beast by the witch. He lost the little mermaid as he turned into the foaming sea. Even dear Rapunzel love call was an echoey memory. But maybe this time his dreams will have come true. Once upon a time, an elderly man lived with his wife in a small terraced house. They had a charming daughter who was so sweet and kind, and she would do anything to please her parents. Unfortunately, the old father had very poor eyesight. So poor, in fact, he had not seen that his wife had left him. He thought, see, I just popped out to the shops. Oh, what are we gonna do, dear daughter, he said, when the truth sunk in. Oh, better put the word around that I need another wife when the divorce come through. And so it came to the ears, eyes and tooth of a very cruel widow who lived nearby. She herself had two ghastly daughters who bore a striking resemblance to their mother, who was, in fact, a witch. The next day, the witch and her daughters presented themselves to the old man's house. She's as pretty as a picture, drooled the short-sighted father. I shall marry her, and before you could say cauliflower, they were down at the registry office for the ceremony. After a short honeymoon in Pays en Bois, the happy family unit returned to the house, where the two ugly sisters made the kind daughter do all the grotty jobs. She got so tired that she used to curl up under the chimney. You filthy child! Why, look how proud and vain my daughters are, while you sleep in the filthy embers. We shall call you Cinderella. They might have called her anthracite, but luckily for the pantomime industry, they didn't. Although Cinderella had to wear cast-offs, such as her father's gardening trousers, she was still a hundred times more beautiful than her two stepsisters. Now it happened that nearby lived a king, and about this time of the year, he sent out invitations 
to all the most important people in the land to come to a magnificent masked ball to be held at the palace. Due to the usual cock-up at Chigwell sorting office, the invitation due to the lovely Bow Bell daughters was misdirected and found its way instead to the humble cottage where Cinderella lived. The short-sighted father was about to throw it on the fire. Wait, screamed his wife, snatching the envelope from him. As he opened it, she realized that the opportunity to socially elevate her daughters had landed in her lap. You're invited to the ball. Your days at the Wood Green Palady Dance are a thing of the past. <laughs> of course, it was necessary for the two sisters to have new clothes for the ball. They paid a visit to the little tailor. He laid out dress after dress before them all of which they rejected in the most haughty manner. Even Cinderella wouldn't be seen dead in these. We came for fine clothes, not rags. You'll have to lose weight, the pair of you, said the witch, reflecting on their passion for hamburgers. Suddenly, the little tailor remembered some of his most outrageous creations, which he despairingly showed them. Perfect, they said in unison, snatching up the outfits and paying the little tailor. <laughs> On the great day, poor Cinders was made to do all the ironing, pressing and starching for her two stepsisters. And after a mammoth struggle, she managed to lace them into their corset. She was so exhausted by the time the taxi arrived, she collapsed in a heap by the fire. She'd no idea who left it there. If only my fairy godmother was here, she cried, as her tears fell on the dying embers, filling the kitchen with steam. Suddenly, she was aware of a rumbling above her in the chimney. Perhaps Cinders was dreaming. Maybe Father Christmas was coming early. The rumbling grew louder and louder. I'll get that little pig if it's the last thing I do. Then, with a final roar and a tangle of drying towels and clouds of soot, a wolf stood before her, draped in cloth. Oh, I was hoping you were my fairy godmother. But I am your fairy godmother, said the wolf, riding his luck like mad. Could you arrange for me to go to the ball? Will those three pigs be there? Yes, they will, she replied, thinking he meant the two horrid sisters and their mother. She didn't like being rude, but really, everybody has their breaking point. If I'm nice to this little girl, she's gonna get me into the feast of all time, said the wolf under his rancid breath. Okay now, there's not a minute to lose. We gotta get you fixed up. First, you're gonna need a coat. Cinderella said she didn't have a coat, but she did have a pumpkin that the witch was saving for her Halloween. A coat would have been better, but I suppose a pumpkin will have to do. Cinderella said they would need something to pull the coat. The only thing they could think of was the six white mice that the witch was planning to put in the soup. Hoistly, 
I preferred horses, but these mises will just have to do. Next, they turned their attention to the footman. Oh, that's easy. The witch always keeps lizards, and they make excellent footmen. And would me, as the coach driver, were just about tickety-boo. So, what are we waiting for? When he turned to Cinderella, she was slumped at the table. It's no use, said Cinders. At a pinch, we might have fooled them with the pumpkin and the mice, but they'll never let me in wearing these rags. Maybe it's a fancy dress ball, and you could go as a street urchin. Well, it isn't, and I can't. Oh, that horrid, horrid witch! Pumpkin turned into a coach, the mice into six white horses, <laughs> the lizard into footman, and the wolf into a splendid coachman, complete with cap and red button jacket. What a sight! But more to the point, Cinderella was dressed in a beautiful party gown with the most exquisite glass slippers. Now we can go. Provided? Provided what? Provided we leave by midnight on the dot. He explained he had to pick up another party from Watford Gap Services. So, don't be late back on the coach. So, on the proudest day of her life, Cinderella set off in the coach towards the palace. The coach trundled down the street of her humble childhood, Muck Lane and Dustbin Avenue, and onwards to the total apathy of the residents, who were too busy watching the National Lottery. After Frequent glances at an A to Z map. The wolf managed to find the palace where a footman helped Cinderella down the steps of the coach. She handed in her cloak and glided up the stairs to the hall. As the doors flung open, all eyes turned to Cinderella. The prince rushed forward and escorted her to the head of the table. On command, the orchestra struck up the prince's favorite musk gavotte. seen a St. Boynan Waltz. <laughs> I got them all. on my toe? No, but I can learn it. <laughs> I'm gonna eat you all up. <laughs> oh, 
laughed at the dance. The two ugly sisters were furious that the prince only had eyes for the beautiful newcomer. Don't worry about her. It should give her sweet dreams. For the next hundred years. <laughs> I must leave at once. But you must stay. I command you to stay, said the prince. I say. Wake up! Cinderella charged through the dance floor. The prince was in hot pursuit, but I don't even know her name. She bounded down the stairs, the prince following her by sliding down the banisters and crushing his privates. Oh. No tiki, no cloak. That's the rule. As she dashed out, she tripped, Woo. and one of her glass slippers slipped off into the gutter. The prince stopped to pick it up and clutched it to his cheek as Cinderella stumbled up the mighty palace bell struck midnight and instantly the coach horses and footmen turned back into their former selves and the prince saw a girl dressed in rags i say urchin girl did you see a princess pass this way but it was too late the prince made his way back to the banqueting hall dejectedly clutching the glass slipper. A fat lady started to sing. And the party was over, and the two sisters bowed decorously to the prince and made their exit. But the prince was on another planet. He decreed there and then that whomsoever the slipper fitted exactly, he would marry. The court water guard was detailed to check every young lady in the kingdom, starting naturally with the most important members of society, Cheltenham Ladies College. Left foot forward, present! He barked at the ladies as he tried in vain to get the slipper to fit. In desperation to find a suitable foot, the corporal tried everyone, even the giant. Be by bo bum, this shoe won't fit. Oh, strike me down. With mounting desperation, the corporal left the dumbstruck giant and found himself knocking on the door of 12 Dripping Lane, East 7. With it, lift foot, forward, present. As the over-eager, ugly sisters tried in vain to force their podgy feet into the slipper. May I try? <laughs> Let the stupid child try if she wishes. Very gently, Cinderella slipped her foot into the glass slipper. It was a perfect fit. I should be very obliged. If you could produce the other slipper, there's two tidy things up like. Of course, said the smiling Cinderella. My slipper, it's gone. I know it has, said the witch, producing it from under her cloak. <laughs> now no one will have it. And she hurled the spinning slipper through the air. And in the flash, Cinderella turned into a beautiful princess. The two ugly sisters turned into spiders. The witch turned into a five-string banjo. The father's eyesight returned. Twelve dripping lane turned into a palace. The wolf turned into a butler and the prince won the lottery and married Cinderella. <laughs> <laughs>
that very morning. Now then, how's that for a happy ending? <laughs>